So the topic tonight is urban imprint. And for a group of New Yorkers, what better place and time to talk about urban issues with four completely diverse experts at the University of Chicago. And I'll introduce them all in a moment. When I talk about a place, is there any place in New York more beautiful than this? I don't think so. And you think about the impact that this place had on the entire surrounding area, it's truly staggering. In terms of a time, you know, here in New York, we are about to go through a transition in government that is remarkably stark. Two very different competing visions for what a city is and how to make a city great. And in a broader context, of course, urban issues um, are becoming so much more important, so much more discussed. Last year was the first time that more than 50% of the world's population lived in cities. That number is going up. When you think about the relationship between urban issues and universities, you know, whereas in the 70s, beginning in the 70s, you saw a decline of urban studies programs, we're seeing an explosion of them now around the country and around the world. And I will tell you, no university engages both academically and in a community-based way more with its surrounding community than the University of Chicago. Um, and so it's really a thrill to have this conversation here tonight. So I want to introduce our panelists briefly, um, and they'll talk a little bit more about themselves. On my far right is uh, Professor Charlie Catlett. Uh, Charlie, uh, a true Renaissance man, um, has joint appointments at the University of Chicago and at the affiliated Argonne National Labs. He's the director of the Na Urban Center for Computation and Data. And his focus is on urban data science, cybersecurity, and privacy. And in addition, he is a visiting artist, he can explain that, at the uh, Art Institute of Chicago. Kate Cagney, on my right, is an associate professor of sociology and health studies. She's the director of the Population Research Center at the university. And her focus is on social inequality and its relationship to health with a focus on neighborhoods, race, um, aging, and the entire um, life course. And, you know, Kate's focus is on develop, and one of the focuses is on developing new methods to measure and define neighborhoods themselves. When I talk about Renaissance man, men, there is probably no better example than Theaster Gates. He is the director of the Arts, uh, of arts and Public Life at the university. Um, you can see in the booklets the resumes of everybody, but he has won multiple, multiple awards. And what's so interesting about him is that his work spans both urban environments, urban planning, and is a sculptor as well as creating performance art. Um, his real focus, I think he might say, is in placemaking. What does that mean? Transforming spaces, institutions, traditions, um, and practices, and he'll talk a little bit about that. And then finally, on my far left, is Derek Douglas. Derek's been at the university for two years. He joined from the White House, where he was in the Domestic Policy Con uh, Council, focusing on urban policy issues. He's a lawyer by training, uh, worked for a law firm, the NAACP, former governor of New York, David Patterson. Um, and so you see you have an incredible um, group of panelists. So welcome to all of the panelists. Now let me, let me start off with a, uh, a question for each of you. Um, each of you um, addresses in your work quality of life in urban areas. What intrigues you about urban areas and you know, how does your work kind of involve it? Charlie? Uh, I think my interest in urban areas comes from 
being a computer scientist and working on computation problems that often are not very connected to the people that you see walking down the street every day. So when I started looking at cities and the challenges that cities have, the light bulb that came, that went off for me was, gee, I can apply the things that I do in computer science to directly impact people's lives on the street. Uh, and it's not so direct uh, uh, to work on climate change or uh, airflow over a wing of an airplane or other sorts of computational science uh, uh, problems. So this was a way to take computation and, and apply it to real people. We started this center uh, just about a year and a half ago and it came out of a series of conversations between computer scientists, uh, you mentioned the Art Institute of Chicago, uh, designers, architects, social scientists like Kate, and we began to have a series of discussions asking ourselves, what sort of problems could we address as an as a interdisciplinary group that we wouldn't be able to address on our own? And out of that, one of the first things that came to mind was urban sciences. So if we could go to the next uh, slide. One of the reasons that I'm interested in urban sciences, besides the connection to people, is that we see what's happening around the world and the rate at which cities are growing, especially in China. So we use China as an example. Uh, as, as you mentioned, 50% of the globe now, more than 50% lives in cities. China is going to move 400 million people into cities. It's, it's an organized move, it's not just a happening on its own over the next several decades, which means they've got to build a Manhattan scale set of infrastructure every year for the next several decades. Now how they do that, how they design that infrastructure will have implications not just for China and people living in those cities, have implications for the climate, for energy, uh, how well they do their transportation networks will have a direct impact on how much fuel is used how well they do build, building efficiency. So this seemed like not only a challenge to address people on the street, but also address some of the long-term issues that we face uh, around the world. So I can go to the next slide. One of the things that also came out of these discussions was a sense that in Chicago, we have several timely opportunities to look at those two issues of people on the street and major challenges facing the globe. One of them is that Chicago has been very aggressive at publishing data about the city operations and at enabling us to collect data about, uh, about the city, such as all of the buses, all of the city vehicles are tracked with GPS. And we can, we can look after a snowstorm and we can ask the question mathematically, did the snow plows move around using an algorithm that was efficient or is there a better one? And there's data to actually answer that question that didn't exist a few years ago. So this also gives us an opportunity as computer scientists to work with social scientists like Kate and others who have had access to very sparse data, mostly historic, often outdated in the past. And to say, how do you change the way you do social science by taking advantage of this new data that we've never had before? The second opportunity in Chicago is something called the Chicago Lakeside Project now, to build for 400 million people in China means that the projects are not going to be 30 acre projects or buildings here and there. They're going to be multiple square mile projects. And the architecture and urban design industry knows how to do a single building, a complex of buildings. But if you talk to people in that industry, they don't know how to anticipate the impact of a 600 acre development like the Chicago Lakeside project. So let's go to the next slide. One of the things that we're doing then is we're bringing together the social sciences, the economics, uh, the humanities, with the, the physical sciences. As it turns out, Argonne does engineering, physical sciences. The university does social, economic, behavioral sciences. So we want to bring those disciplines together. And this really is, although there are a lot of urban institutes around, this is really a unique mix that we've, we've put together. And we want to look at these large perturbations of cities, whether it's uh, 600 acres or 1,000 acres, and ask the question, over the next 20 years, 50 years, what will be the impact of that development on the environment, on the built infrastructure, and on people and the societies, the economies, 
that are surrounding that environment? What will be the impact on Lakeside, of Lakeside on the south side of Chicago? And the way we do this, I think there may be a click there that you have to do for this slide, is by taking what we do in computation in several areas. The first is computational modeling. Looking out uh, at a 20-year forecast of climate, of energy use, of transportation, and allowing a developer or a city policymaker to turn the knobs on possible plans and look at the impact that might come of that. Second is data analytics. And that's a little more short term, looking at impact of policies or decisions over days or weeks or months. And the last is sensing, and in addition to sensing, uh, which you would understand as climate sensors and other sensors throughout the city, we're exploring how you might embed information services within the built environment to allow people to interact with the city in a more friendly way, in a more helpful way. And we do this through community building. And we'll talk uh, as we go to Kate about how the Lakeside Project is an example of where we've brought together these many disciplines to say, let's look at environment, infrastructure, and society, but let's look at them not in silos, but let's look at them together. Kate, how about you? How does your work address quality of life issues in urban environments? Well, I'd like to think that, um, that the notion of living in urban social space is actually beneficial to all of us, and so one of key questions I've always wanted to examine is the idea that living in close social space is actually good, promotes trust and solidarity, and it's actually one of the things we want to examine in the Lakeside Project is to understand who lives together, how they live together, um, and how... Can you just explain a sure. little bit more for everybody who may not be familiar yes. exactly what the Lakeside Project is? So here it is, <laughs> right now in front of you. This is uh, 589 acres between 79th and 96th on the south side of Chicago, and it is the former site of U.S. Steel. It is now a joint venture between U.S. Steel and McCaffrey Interests, and they're working with Skid Mullings and Merrill. To Just to put this in perspective, by yes. the way, this would be about 75% the size of Central Park. Right, and it is the size of Chicago's Loop, as many of you I know are familiar with Chicago. Um, so if we want to go to the next slide, this is the vision uh, that Skidmoreings and Merrill and McCaffrey interests have for Lakeside in 2050. And so as social scientists, one of the key ways that we can interact is to help us understand how we move from the photo that you just saw to this development in 2050. And so right now we're engaged in baseline data collection to ask residents in nearby communities how they feel about Lakeside, what they think and what they'd like to see. And we want to combine that social survey with other kinds of data collection that along the way will um, identify key turning points in the evolution of this community and use social science data and methods to inform the best way to, for instance, um, make choices about where a building's located or the mix between residential and commercial space, which it has been informed um, in the early 60s by uh, people like Jane Jacobs. So we go back to some of those kinds of methods and models uh, to help us make decisions about building location and how that creates the cohesion that I mentioned at the beginning. Do you, are you aware of any kind of major development like this that you would say has been a real success, sort of ground up, planned development? I'm not aware of a development of this size and scale in the United States. And that's one of the things we've spent some, we spent last summer actually trying to track. We can come up with a lot of um, smaller scale efforts uh, I think Millennium Park is a fantastic you example. You have to go outside line. of yeah. the developed world to look at you something do. this big. That's exactly and right. you see it in China. And if you talk to the Chinese, they would not call these large developments a success. Right. <laughs> We'd like to go to the next slide. Um, I mentioned what social scientists can bring. One thing we bring are data. And uh, this shows you the 15 community areas in two towns in Indiana that we presume will be most affected by Lakeside's development. Uh, these community areas initially were theorized um, in the 20s and 30s in the Chicago School of Sociology to help us understand neighborhood demarcations. And what I'd like you to note here is that these, uh, um, these colors represent different household income levels on the south side of Chicago. And so the swath that actually just sits under Lakeside, and Lakeside um, is, is on the right-hand side of where, where you see South Chicago, and you see a little peninsula sticking out, that's where the Lakeside space will be. And so one thing to note here is that um, this is a community that, that is resource poor. And so one of the things we really have to think about is how 
a new community like Lakeside could be synthetic with the community that surrounds it. And if we can go to the next slide, this is actually homing in on the community that is adjacent to the Lakeside development. And um, there are two things I'd like you to note here. One is that you see pretty significant variation by income just within this one community area. So it means we have to be attentive to variation on a small scale. Um, we also need to think too, and this comes um, from Chicago School of Sociology work as well, but we can think about it in, in some ways of concentric circles of influence. And so we may want to think about um, what, uh, you know, for the communities that are closer, what might make people, for instance, feel compelled to walk to the lake. This will be the first time um, since U.S. Steel was built that people on the south side of Chicago will have access to the lake. It's actually the only part of, of the lakefront that hasn't been public. Um, so that's, that's a significant move. Um, and we want to see what will encourage people to walk to be engaged in the community. And then we might think about how commercial development could vary as we move out from Lakeside. Um, that point brings me to the next slide in a thinking about innovation. And so um, we often talk about um, communities that are innovation from a technical standpoint or commercial standpoint. One of the things we'd like to do is to think about innovation from a social standpoint. Um, how can we increase connectedness and social glue, expand something we're, we're describing as social anchors. So instead of the Home Depot, why not an art installation? Why not something like the fountain in Millennium Park in Chicago? Those are the things that draw us all out to share social space. We begin to know one another, we make eye contact, and that's what creates the social glue I mentioned earlier. We also imagine a community that would encourage age integration, have high quality education, healthcare, the public open space I mentioned when um, we talked about the new park that will be adjacent to the lake, um, and more generally, how to enhance the community through these social science data and methods we can bring to bear with our computer science colleagues. Hey, Esther, uh, I'm gonna guess that your remarks won't talk a whole lot about data. Uh, huh. Can you tell us a little bit about sort of your work and kind of how you're, re you engage in sort of these urban issues? Sure. No, it's true. Uh, while, while on the surface the work has nothing nothing to do with data, it seems to have to do with kind of magic making. Um, I, I think that the reality is when we look at neighborhoods like Washington Park and Woodlawn and the areas around the University of Chicago, uh, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that um, these neighborhoods have been undervalued. Um, from my artistic practice, I learned pretty early that, that art has the capacity to change people's perceptions um, of, a, of an idea, uh, but maybe also of a place. And I know that um, for many people, um, the South Side, and especially the Black South Side, kind of the areas that surround the university, um, psychically there are places where you just don't want to be. And so I've, I've tried to think, how can I leverage my, my kind of understanding of art and how people view art to, to help them reimagine what could happen on the South Side? One of the things that's become really clear is that um, in order for people's opinions about a place or a thing to change, they have to be confronted with that new thing, you know. And so a lot of the work that I've been doing through arts and public life and in my own practice is identifying key spaces on the south side of Chicago and trying as best as I can to both give the, the building, one building at a time, not, not 500 acres or 6,000 buildings, but one building at a time turning that building around and then enlivening it with the most amazing programming possible so that people can imagine uh, other things happening there. And that if we're successful with one building, that that one building turns into 10, and, and then the data follows. But in my case, I found that, that um, uh, there are moments when uh, we can plan, but in, in neighborhoods that have been so poorly divested in, you, you almost need a miracle to kickstart it. Now, what is a miracle? A miracle is money, and it's belief, and it's people with some sweat equity, and maybe uh, when people talk about artists reimagining Soho and these things, that there are people who are a little bit crazy, who um, despite the numbers, are willing to be generous to a place. Next slide. And so we built this space that we call the Washington Park Arts Incubator. 
which is a 10,000 square foot space. The University of Chicago owns it. It's on the west side of Washington Park. Um, it's the part of the park that people don't normally go to. You try to you know, take the red line, the 55, as quickly as you can past that area. Um, but what we found was that uh, once the incubator was built, that there was a tremendous kind of outpour of need and curiosity from the neighborhood that surrounded the incubator and from our university students and faculty that said, you know, this is a place where amazing music performances could happen, dance can happen, public symposium, artists in residencies, exhibitions. And um, in the six months that we've been open, we've had over 5,000 users come through those doors. We've not had one broken window. Um, and it's the, it's the pilot to a larger reinvestment initiative that'll happen on Garfield Boulevard. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And so in my own practice, I've, I've tried to take these moments that simply are outliers in our traditional way of imagining what has value. Um, that this, this building, is, which is at 68th and Stony Island, it's the um, Stony Island State Savings Bank. Um, the city was on the brink of tearing down the building because the, the parapet started to fail. The, the, the terracotta on the parapet, uh, those things weigh 60 pounds each. If they fall, uh, could do a lot of damage. Three days uh, b before the building was to be demolished, I asked the mayor if he would consider saving it. I found out later that um, 17 developers had tried to redevelop the building over 25 years <coughs> and simply couldn't make the money work, couldn't make the numbers work. And so how, how is it then? What is the magic necessary? And I think that that magic requires an even more savvy uh, uh, investment model, but it also it, it, it requires people who believe in a place. And so this idea that you call placemaking, I think is really a kind of um, a catchphrase for the willingness to grapple longer with a very tough problem in a particular place to make the lives of people around that place better. And uh, I'm into that. Next slide. And so I've been trying to create, figure out ways as an artist um, to fund these projects in interesting ways. Um, we did an assessment of the bank. The bank costs a lot of money. And I thought, what can the bank do to pay for itself? Um, we found that the last remaining currency in the bank was these marble bathroom partitions and the wainscoting. We took the marble partitions, we cut them into these laser jet bank bonds, and we sold 100 of these bank bonds at Basel, Switzerland at, a, at an art fair. That half million dollars uh, became useful for the rehab of the bank. That went pretty good, so I made a bigger <laughs> bond. <laughs> <laughs> I made another 10 bonds and I put them at $50,000. And so that million dollars became part of a four or five million dollar investment. And it was the kind of gap funding, creative gap funding necessary in order to make those kind of projects happen. So it, it has a lot to do with our ability to not only reimagine what the space can be, but reimagine economy in a way that makes beautiful things happen in poor places. So, so far we've had kind of data and computer science kind of people at the ground, magic. Derek, you're the, <laughs> the politics and community engagement. These are the four things that actually kind of make kind of they things do. happen uh, in do. interesting ways. Tell us a little bit about sort of you as in the Office of Civic Engagement. You're sure. touching all this stuff. Sure. Uh, yeah, you can see the breath. Really fascinating stuff going on at the university. Um, the thing in my role as Vice President for Civic Engagement that I um, wake up every morning trying to think about is how can the University of Chicago uh, be a catalyst for impact in the city and in the neighborhoods around us? And when I was in the White House, I don't think I appreciated the role of universities or anchor institutions as being catalysts for urban development until I got to the White House. And when, when you're in government, you know, when you're not in government, you think, a lot of people think, oh, you go to the government, they have lots of money, they give you the money, you can do stuff. And when you're in government, <laughs> you realize you actually don't have that much money. Uh, and We're all recognizing We all recognize that. that. <laughs> and if you look at what's happening to cities across the country, even Chicago, the budgets are tightening up dramatically. And so government is not um, always a place that you can go to 
to try and be a, a catalyst for urban development in some of certain neighborhoods. And also the private sector, oftentimes people say, well, if the private sector comes in, let the market do its thing. But that doesn't all work for neighborhoods that are in distress either. As the Astor was pointing out, if you look in the neighborhoods around the University of Chicago, over the last 50 years, the populations have dropped sometimes 80%. Washington Park, where the arts incubator is, it used to be around 50,000 people, now it's 11,000. The neighborhood just south of the university, Woodlawn, used to be around 80, 90,000 people, now it's <coughs> around 25,000. While this is happening in these south side neighborhoods, the city of Chicago, the downtown area, is one of the fastest growing areas in the country. So you have rapid growth in the area where there's more wealth, and in the neighborhoods that are, are not doing as well, you see depopulation, reduced investment. One constant, though, is the university. We're in Hyde Park. We're, we're not going anywhere. We're a place-based entity. So the question that we're thinking about is, how can we use the levers we have as an institution, whether it's through our research, um, whether it's through our talent development and, and producing talent, whether it's through our role as a developer, um, hiring as an employer, uh, service provider, health, and other things. How can we use that role to be a catalyst and an engine for the South Side? And so I think a, good, a great example that I just wanted to highlight briefly is the work that we're doing on 53rd Street in Hyde Park. Now, Hyde Park is not Woodlawn, it's not Washington Park, but compared to the rest of the city and the northern parts of the cities, Hyde Park was, has been dramatically underinvested in. Um, the University of Chicago just opened a hotel, um, I'd say a month or so ago. This was the first hotel built in Hyde Park in over 50 years. If you live in Hyde Park and you want to buy socks, you have to leave your neighborhood. You have to go downtown to buy socks or to buy a belt. Um, you know, if you want to go out for a nice meal, you're leaving your neighborhood. Yet you had a lot of resources there. You had the university there, but it was not viewed as some place where the private market wanted to come in. So the university said, what can we do to be a catalyst, to create some energy, some, a spark that could then lead to greater development? And so what we did there, you'll see the, the, the red um, called Harper Court about I want to say seven, eight years ago, the university bought Harper Court, which those of you who went there, you, you may remember it. It looks a lot different now. Um, they bought Harper Court in a partnership with the city, the private sector, and the community, redeveloped it into an office tower, and we're placing 500 employees on the street who are going to be working in that tower. We um, had land that we leased to a hotel developer who built the first hotel in 50 years. We bought a theater. It was one of the first movie theaters in the country, actually. It had been <coughs> vacant for over 10 years. It was just a, right on the middle of 53rd Street, sitting there vacant. We um, got a, a movie theater operator from the north side who put in a new movie theater, redeveloped it, restored it. It actually won a, a recent award for the restoration of the building. And so now we have a movie theater there where, th where there wasn't one before. We have new restaurants coming in. Um, one just opened, actually, the former executive chef of Charlie Trotter's opened a new restaurant. And people are coming from all over the city to Hyde Park. If you go further out, you see where it says the mobile site. That used to be a mobile gas station um, and a car wash. The university um, brought in a developer who's going to redevelop that site and create apartments with retail, 30,000 square foot of retail at the bottom. Um, to bring more density, more amenities to the neighborhood. With these catalytic moves, oh, also in the red, I should mention, um, I don't have a pointer, but one of the buildings in red at the corner um, is a new innovation center. So the University of Chicago, we recently announced the Chicago Innovation Exchange, which is going to be an incubator proof of concept center for um, creation of small businesses, commercialization of research, new technological development at the university a place where the university community comes together with the private sector to contribute to the innovation economy um, in the city and the region. With those series of moves, it's been dramatically uh, tr been transformative for the neighborhood. 
Now we have all kinds of restaurant owners, chefs coming down, developers trying to get sites to put up new um, retail and other types of amenities. And Hyde Park and 53rd Street is becoming a booming place. I was talking to the owner of the restaurant. He said that this, it's been open a few weeks. He said that the success of this restaurant is beyond anything he could have expected. And he's telling everybody now in the city, this is the place where you need to be. And people are starting to come down. So it's an example of where you know, the regular system, the government, regular private market system wasn't working, but the university with some vision, working in partnership with the community and making some catalytic investments have led to what is the early stages still of a dramatic transformation of the neighborhood. And we're looking at opportunities to do that in the Washington parks, the woodlawns, and other neighborhoods around the university. For those of you who haven't been to Hyde Park recently, kind of go along 53rd Street. It really is amazing. Of course, everyone still wants to know is ribs and bibs ribs still Ribs and there? bibs are still there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Some things are untouchable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. History matters, right, and tradition. I, I want to ask a question about Lakeside because, you know, here at the Astor and Derek have talked about um, the area west of Washington Park where there are acres and acres of essentially depopulation and, you know, the Astor kind of a heroic effort to try and light sparks to have that happen. Here you got Lakeside, a 600 acre development further away from the center of the city, Des despite the fact, you know, with a major focus, despite the fact that, you know, just a few miles to the north, you've got this area that basically has been abandoned. Is it a good thing? Yeah. Are they in competition with one another? Should we have focused more on kind of the areas closer into the center city with more direct transit access from an urban design and urban living perspective? I would say I don't see it as neither or. I think about those um, sorts of initiatives in concert. That, um, that the development that's happening at Lakeside, I think um, I, I can speak to that more directly because that's the project I'm most involved in. But, um, it can have significant spillover effects, not just for, for the area, but you know, there's a potential, and Charlie can speak to this, to change the energy grid. Um, it will draw transportation resources um, to the lakeside space. And actually, if anybody's been um, in Chicago recently, Lakeshore Drive now moves right through <laughs> the lakeside development. So that completely changes the terrain on the south side. So I, I really see it as, as a synthetic effort. Sure. Uh, it, it's a good thing that the lake is open now. Um, for, for, for us, I think Lakeside will happen or not happen regardless right. of what I do as a computer scientist. So for me, the question was, if Lakeside is going to happen, what can we do to make the Lakeside development uh, to make sure that it has the kind of impact on the surrounding neighborhoods that yes. we would like to see if it were the direct focus? And a, as an example, one of the questions for the lakeside development right now is they have to make a huge investment in infrastructure, about $500 million of infrastructure that pipes the roads, et cetera. And one question that we're, the reason we're starting with our work on the energy demand is do we build a combined heat and power plant and do we offer district heating? And if we just look at lakeside, the econo economics of a district heating and a combined heat and power plant will look one way. If we look out into the neighborhood, they look different. Mm -hmm. And so does it make sense economically and from the standpoint of the neighborhood to think more in terms of offering a district heating solution that reaches out into the existing neighborhood, uh, which would give you the critical mass that you need for economies of scale of the plant and also would offer a benefit in terms of cost and, uh, and uh, to, to, the, to the neighborhood. Uh, yes, sir, you're, you're looking to kind of make magic as you said, um, to find those catalysts that can spread way beyond the individual project that you're working on. What do you look for in a site, in a project, to be able to create that? Sure. I'm afraid to say it because there might be some developers in the room they are going to steal my ideas. <laughs> um, I, I think that it requires people who actually really care about a place. And, and that care could be any number of different kinds of constituents. It could be the, the family that's been on a block for 20 years or 30 years or three generations. 
It could be the young, scrappy developer who really likes the way a, the brick look on a particular building, and they want to throw all their money and resource into it. It could be um, the, the, the Charlie Trotter Jr. who's interested in, in um, having a booming underground restaurant culture grow up but can't afford downtown prices. That, that all of these different kinds of folk become the kind of a core constituent that can help, you know, they become the believers in a place. And then you need somebody with some resource that can actually help make a, a, a scalable project happen. So if it starts with a building, it goes to another building, it goes to 20 buildings, that, that it's those kind of initial seed projects that can also incentivize a city to say, hey, something's happening here, maybe we should invest more in the infrastructure of curbs and street lamps, and, and maybe we should invest more in our ad-grade rail or our below-grade rail or our elevated rail. That, that it's, it's those, you know, uh, I think Kate mentioned ripple, the word ripple, that there is this kind of ripple effect that I'm finding um, that if, if you can leverage uh, people who believe with the resources necessary and the institutions that have, that are, that have been long-term partners, that triune has the potential to be something really solid and sustainable. There, I've noticed situations, though, where a person has more of one or the other. That is, they've been there a long time and they have huge organizing power. <coughs> they have a tremendous amount of money and political leverage. Um, uh, they have a really big name in the restaurant, like Marcus Samuelson in, in Harlem, in Uptown, that, that he was able to do things combined with the Studio Museum. That there are times when you may need to have more, you, you play to your strengths. So you may have more, you might have the former mayor of New York in your back pocket. I don't know. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but not yet. <laughs> but but I, do, I do think that there are these moments when, um, that if, if you calibrate these engagements, really amazing things can happen. So everybody here is from New York, obviously with Chicago ties. None of you live in New York. Looking at it from your own particular perspectives, how do you feel about New York? What, is there anything here that either inspires or repulses you about New York, looking at it from, again, your own particular discipline or perspective? And Kate, you want to go first? Sure, yeah. I love New York. <laughs> I live more, more than Chicago? Yeah. Just kidding. Differently. I was just kidding. <laughs> like children. Yeah, I mean, yeah right? How we can love equally. Um, I, yeah, I lived here for many years. I love the city. I mean, I do think one of the things, I mean, we talk about um, the depopulation of the South Side, and that's such a critical feature of what's happened in those neighborhoods. And again, what, what makes streets safe? Streets are safe when everybody's walking around outside. What makes people walk around outside? Destinations. And they can be the lakefront, they can be the dry cleaner, they can be a coffee shop, but that's what draws people outside. It's a lot of research that suggests that the more time people spend outdoors, the healthier they are. Their weight is lower, <coughs> they don't have asthma, they don't have diabetes, all these things that, that suggest that engaging in community uh, makes us healthier individually and collectively. So I think New York is a terrific example of creating animated street life and that that has, again, sort of a ripple effect. I mean, since we could all just like sing the praises of New York, maybe yeah. I'll Maybe I'll challenge it a little bit. Okay. That, <laughs> that one, one of the things, when, when New Yorkers come to Chicago to look at the projects that we're working on, they're, they're often shocked at the amount of impact that we can have because a two flat, you know, in Flatbush would cost you a million dollars, easy. And, and that the, the numbers don't work the same in Chicago. That the Rust Belt, um, um, because of the depopulation that's happening on its kind of exterior, um, uh, the resources just look different. And so I, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, how does words like gentrification play out in a city like New York where people will live I anywhere, that there's not a racial spatial barrier, and it's like, you know, if the building's available and it's, it's in my price range, you know, I'll go, I'll go as far as, you know, the Bronx to, to live where I need to live, that, that I think that Chicago has this great opportunity that New York hasn't had in the last decade, that Chicago has this opportunity for a tremendous amount of concentric circles that build out and out and out and out that are circles um, of, of modest affordability relative to the kind of 
resources that you can make in a city like Chicago. So it's still kind of first nation, first rate uh, in terms of employability, but it also offers this great opportunity. I also wonder a lot about the, the, the kind of mentality of a New Yorker, and maybe it's more the mentality <laughs> of New Yorkers that really turned me on, that there's a way in which New Yorkers are simply willing to engage the world fully um, with, without the burden of um, class and race, that those things have been conflated for so long that it's just like business as usual, where in the Midwest there are moments where our sleepy generosity still has some kind of quiet biases toward people that are more like us or more, you know. And so I'm, 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 I'm impressed by the people of New York and their willingness to just tough it out. Derek or <laughs> Charlie, anything you want to add? Uh, you know, when I, I, my dad worked in New York when I was growing up, and so I've been in and out of the city quite a bit. Um, what I like about New York is it, it's a center of a lot of uh, important decisions that get made. Corporations are here, the, uh, the media is here, and I'm interested in how, how we can uh, take advantage of those decisions uh, outside of the borders of New York. Uh, in places like Chicago. In Chicago, there are, you know, large businesses and decisions get made, not at the same scale of New York. So Chicago is walkable and in more human scale. New York is sort of not you know, superhuman scale, I suppose. I, I yeah. would, uh, if ahead, I could just add, the, the thing I like, I, used to, I think all of us probably lived in New York at some point. I lived here for a while, too. And one of the things that's, that's kind of taken for granted and appreciated in New York is the, the values of density, which is something that in Chicago, it's not as understood or appreciated as much. We've seen that in the work that we're doing on the South Side. So one of the challenges, to the extent there was kind of a, a, a challenge in doing this development even in 53rd Street, was this notion of we don't want more people on the street. Like, we want the amenities, we want that stuff, we don't want the, we don't want people coming down, we don't want the cars, we don't want X, Y, or Z. People think that, you know, they don't want appreciate to the same level transit, and walking is, mm -hmm. you know, a legitimate way to get around sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in the Midwest, it's a car. So with people, yeah. it means cars. So I think that the way that, you know, New York has so figured out the density and how it's just part of the fabric of the life, and, and it's one of the things that people value so much, that's one of the things that in Chicago, we're starting to, you know, in certain neighborhoods, we're starting to, to, to come to grips with, but we're not there. And it's a lesson that I think we can learn from the city. There are a lot in Chicago, at the university, as I mentioned before, you can see them in your program. There are literally maybe 15 different institutes or departments that are focused on urban issues. I mean, it's truly impressive. There's the Crime Lab, the Urban Education Institute, the, the, um, the organizations that all of you are involved in, and many more. I mean, it's really incredible. Mm -hmm. What do you think the University of Chicago could do differently, if anything, to maximize its impact um, in the local community, or by the way, on urban environments more broadly? I think that, you know, one of the main things we can do, and it's actually something that is in the works right now, is to figure out a way to take these various institute initiatives that, for the most part, are relatively siloed and you know, have their different constituencies, but they're doing their things kind of independently, and figure out a way to bring them together into, not to, um, not to change what they do, but to make them more part of a coherent whole, a coordinated whole. Um, at the university right now, there's a lot of thought going in by some of our deans around creating an institute for urban science and urban practice. There's a, some materials on it outside. And the idea is to create this infrastructure that's interdisciplinary that can create opportunities, resources that can help enliven and energize all the various initiatives that are around, but also make it a, an infrastructure that's easier to to gain access to the university and the many riches we have in urban. When I was in the White House, I was leading urban policy for President Obama. And when you had an urban policy question, 
you often didn't go to a university. You would go to Brookings or something like that, in part because it was harder to navigate. There were so many different things you didn't know which door to mm. go through. And I think that at the University of Chicago, probably more than any other university in the country, we have the expertise, the resources, the, the, the knowledge, the history around dealing with urban challenges and providing urban solutions in anywhere. And just, just figuring out a way to bring those pieces together, you know, make the sum of the parts, the whole greater than the sum of the parts, that's, I think, the next frontier for the university. Anybody else have a view on what, if anything, should be done differently? I, I, th I think, as the Astro Mavis have said, play to your strength. I think one of the strengths of the university is how easy it is to reach across from one discipline to another and find people to work with. Uh, I, I, we, we hired uh, President Obama as uh, the, the chief scientist for, for his re-election campaign, data scientist guy. We hired him in, and, and as I was, it wasn't hard to convince him to come to U of Chicago, but his, his concern that he expressed, I had to apologize because I laughed, and he said, do you think that people across campus and other disciplines will want to work with me? And I said, you'll be fighting them off because they all want to do data mm -hmm. science and they all want to do, they've caught this vision for working across disciplines. Um, I, I was at a Santa Fe Institute workshop with 50 leaders from many universities and institutes about a month ago. And a discussion ensued in the room about how hard it is to do interdisciplinary science. So I let the discussion go on for a while and then I kind of raised my hand and I said, we haven't found interdisciplinary science to be hard. We find people that we like to work with. We talk about the things we're interested in. We find a common problem or opportunity, and then we do it. And that's how Kate and I have worked together. Um, and there's, uh, what the university I think is, is moving toward with this idea of an institute is, is to go from the ad hoc connections, which are great, and, and give them something to shoot for that's sort of a set of common goals. And that's what we've seen with the Lakeside projects, what we've seen with Chicago uh, data. It's been easy for me to get economists, social scientists, behavioral scientists involved because this is a shared, how cities work, this is a shared interest that we all have. Uh, how do you think the relationship between the university um, and the city? I mean, one of the great things about the University of Chicago is it's in Chicago. Mm -hmm. You know, it was founded as a great American university in a great American city. How can the city be leveraged better? Or conversely, how can the city leverage the university better um, to improve the lives of people in the city? Maybe I'll, I'll jump with that and I'll, I'll maybe tie it to your last question about how do we maximize our impact. Um, there was a really wonderful um, scientist who recently passed at the university. His name was Eugene Goldwasser. And Eugene, he spent his life thinking about blood and how to make it clot. He eventually found uh, that there was a, a sugar that was produced in our bodies that if that, that sugar enzyme was used properly, something cool could happen in this thing. And he spent 20 years thinking about this problem. It took an outside firm to, to look at this amazing research that he had been doing, and, and, and he was unwilling to come out of the lab. It, it, it wasn't his calling. But this other company was able to then say, hey man, you know, this thing that you're doing could have huge medical implications for people who are, in quote, things. And he was like, cool. So they patented this thing. That I think that one, one of the things that I'd love to see in terms of maximizing is, is the theory practice piece. Mm -hmm. That we have great theorists who are working on all man manner of things. But there are definitely moments where um, it stays in the lab, it, it stays in the book. And so finding the practical application sometimes or the partners who can engage with us <coughs> to make those great ideas um, have a simpatico impact in the world, I think is something that we can do. And I think that the city is now ready to leverage the university, that I think we've come a, a long way in, in, in this way of saying, here are the great assets that we have, and those assets are thinking. How do we apply some of this great research to, to the city of Chicago and make things happen? 
And this is actually, I th this is one reason why I think Lakeside is such a compelling project, yeah. is because it actually is a manifestation <laughs> of theory and practice. That's right. We can actually take these ideas and say, what difference does it make? What difference does it make in these people's lives? How can we draw people to live in the South Side and create the kind of social interaction that's health enhancing? And so I, 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 I think that's actually a great example. There's two things on this notion, the city universe relationship. One, Charlie actually alluded to it in his yeah. opening remarks, which was that the city um, can provide data yeah. to our scholars which can be a huge benefit to the scholarship they do, but also the results of the scholarship go back and impact the city. Right. He mentioned the work he's doing with Urban CCD. Another great example is the, you know, the um, Urban Education Institute, mm -hmm. where they have the consortium on school research that gets proprietary data from the city. They have basically have every data point from CPS, the Chicago Public School System, mm -hmm. going back decades. They can use that data to evaluate different types of programs, teaching, practice, curriculum, and then they do these studies which show this works, this didn't work, that then goes back and informs the way CPS um, implements its policies, implements its programs. Another key area for um, collaboration is around development. <laughs> so when, when Rahm Emanuel became mayor, one of the first things he did was set up a meeting with his team and each university independently because he recognized we are not going to be able to do what I want done in Chicago on our own. We need to rely on our, our greatest assets, which are our colleges and universities. And they, des they developed an MOU. University of Chicago was the first one, but they developed an MOU with the university and the city where it talked about complementary investments, complementary development. So if the university, we let them know, here's where we're thinking of doing X, here's where we're doing, thinking of doing Y then the city will build on that with some of its infrastructure um, investments and other things. So you get the two complementing each other as opposed to working in isolation from each other. I know here, and I know we have to close in a moment, I know here in New York, um, certainly the Bloomberg administration always viewed um, universities as key economic engines. So Columbia, for example, its expansion um, up in Manhattanville should be an engine of creating jobs, not just there, but in life sciences for generations to come. You know, better known is the uh, RFP that was won by Cornell and Technion to create an applied sciences, the high tech university on Roosevelt Island. And we could kind of go on and on and on. So, I mean, I know in Chicago, Mayor Emanuel sort of sees the University of Chicago as a similar driver of activity and it's been from an outsider's perspective somebody who really kind of watches the relationship between universities um, and cities that potential for collaboration is extraordinary and the university sort of gathering forces to capitalize on it across the board yeah. is really extraordinary I see our time is almost up. Derek, I know you were going to make sort of closing for, remarks. Just for a couple oh, did, of, did you want to say something else? No, go ahead. Just for a couple of the closing seconds, we have about 30 seconds, but I just wanted to thank you, Dan, and all the panelists for um, being here tonight and, and all of the guests who came here who have been such great supporters of the University of Chicago over the years. You know, the goal for tonight was to give you a glimpse of the work that the university is doing on urban issues, but also the vision that we have and President Zimmer has for really taking this work to the next level. Um, in my view, as you think about, you know, Dan mentioned that more than 50% of the people live in cities today. If you project to 2050, it's gonna be 80% of the people. And so a university that's at the cutting edge of understanding these challenges, being able to address them, being a resource for the city, for cities around the world, is really going to be well positioned, I think, for, for decades to come. And the support that you all give to the university and for these urban um, initiatives in particular is, is so crucial and critical to us. We want to thank you for that. Um, with that, the time is up, and I hope everyone had an enjoyable evening and look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks,